Um, so hello, hello everyone. Welcome to my talk in this very special for restriction online workshop. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this very special event in this very special time. Okay. Um, so the topic for today for my talk is a new a square function estimate and as well as a local smoothing estimate for a class of free integral operators. Okay, so let's uh, go straight into the talk. Uh, so this is more of um, a, a work based on a, con a well-known conjecture in the Euclidean space, which is called local smoothing conjecture for wave equations. So let's look at the basic setup. Uh, we look at the wave equation, just the ordinary wave equation in Rd plus d plus one, okay? Then there are some classical estimates which tells you how the solution behaves in terms of the LP norm of the initial data. Here it's U0 and U1 here. Okay, and those are fixed time estimates, which means that we are doing this for each fixed time t. Okay, so this constant depends on t, but if you take t in the compact interval, this will be uniform. Okay. And um, there's also this SP here, uh, which is the exponent for the, the loss of regularities you expect when you do this kind of fixed time estimate. Okay, and this will be sharp in terms of the loss of regularity. Okay, um, intuitively it's because of, uh, we, we can have, we, we, when you uh, propagate this initial data with respect to the time t here, okay, so the, the initial data will move like a wave packet, okay? But there, there can be many wave packets move that's traveling in time where they can actually overlap a lot at a certain time. That's why we have this loss in regularity basically due to that, all right? Of course, if we integrate this, actually we take the piece power of the inequality and we integrate it in time in the compact time interval, then we'll get the same estimate for the LP space time norm. Okay, but the question is, we know that this we have this loss of regularity because the overlapping of the interaction of the wave packets. Okay, but if since we're also integrating in time, we should expect something better, right? Because the wave packet cannot be overlapping all the time. If they intersect at a certain time, they will basically be um, not overlapping for other times, kind of. So the question is, can we do better? And this is Stubbs' famous local smoothing conjecture. So some uh, conjecture that we can do much better. And he himself in the same paper also showed that we can at least do a little bit better with some uh, new techniques at that time. Okay, so actually some conjecture says that for p greater than a critical point, okay, so for people uh, familiar with free restriction, uh, you can see that this is exactly the exponent for the free restriction conjecture, okay? So for p larger than this exponent, we expect a one over p improvement over the loss of regularity for the fixed, fixed time estimate, okay? And for p between two and the critical um, exponent, Okay, then the expression for SP will be uh, actually uh, less than one over P. Okay, so we cannot expect uh, improvement over that. So the best we can hope for is SP itself, which means that in this range, U is almost bounded on the LP space. Okay, all right, some remarks. First of all, uh, just like many con uh, conjectures in this kind of form, the strongest one happens at the end point. In this, uh, not really the endpoint, the critical point. I'm sorry. Okay, because we can interpolate between trivial L2 estimates, which is just an energy estimate, and L infinity estimates, which is also not, not hard. Okay. And the second, this local smoothing conjecture in the Euclidean setting is very strong. It actually implies, if this is true in any dimension, implies the Bachner-Risk conjecture, implies the free restriction conjecture for parabola, and it also implies the calculation conjecture. Okay, 
Now let's look, uh, br briefly look at the history of this problem. Okay. Uh, after Sark introduced this problem, uh, Sark himself and Martin Hopf and Seeger, they uh, have a joint work on this, which gave us better uh, partial results at the end point, at the critical point, P2, which is two times two over one as four, okay? By introducing this new tool called score function estimates, which is also the topic of today, some for different, for more generalized problem. And this kind of result in this direction was improved by later works of Tau, Vargas, Wolf, and Lee. Okay, in another direction, instead of proving improved uh, loss of regularity at the critical point, we can also hope to prove sharp local smoothing in terms of the loss of regularity for a different value of piece. Uh, Wolf actually did this. He proved that he, he was the first one to prove any sharp local smooth estimate. He proved it for large P, okay, in 2D plus, uh, in 2 plus 1D, by introducing a concept now known as the coupling inequalities for the cone. And this, in this direction, it was later proved by Gregor Seeger, Schlagenborgen, and so on. Okay, so this improvement, by improvement, I mean getting a larger range of P by proving uh, better, uh, more refined coupling inequalities. Okay. The end of Vargas um, tried it in another direction. So Wolf worked in the large P uh, case, Leon Vargas worked in the small, smaller P case, but they used the same tool as was de developed by Ohnhoff, Seeger, and Sock by proving sharp um, new uh, square function estimate. They proved the sharp local smoothing estimate for P uh, strictly less than four. It's the actually between two and three in two plus one. Okay, and for again, Demeter was the one, uh, was the ones to actually close the story in this direction. They proved the sharp decoupling inequalities, which only works for p greater to six in two plus one d. Okay, and that will imply uh, the local smoothing conjecture for the same range of p, so p greater to six. The conjecture range is p greater equal to four, so they're very close. Okay, and another remark is that their result also works in higher dimension. So not only for p greater equal to six, it's actually for p greater equal to 2d plus 1 over d minus 1. So that's actually the uh, Thomas Stein index. Okay. And very recently, uh, in a little more than a year ago, Guswan and Zhang actually confirmed the local sensing conjecture in the 2 plus 1d by proving the full range of sharp square function estimates this is proposed by uh, Martin Hobbes. Okay. But slightly different from the approach of Bergen Demeter, their work. Um, heavily depend on many um, useful features of this dimension being two here. So their result does not easily generalize to higher dimensions. Okay, all right. So uh, to state the uh, idea behind the Goose Wang Zhang paper, and actually the more general, general strategies for all of this, uh, let's look at some uh, attack strategies behind us. Okay, so for simplicity, we let's consider a solution to the equation with only one part of the initial data. If you have a U1 here, things can be handled similarly, in a similar way, okay? Then the UXT can be written in terms of this half wave operator acting on U0, actually a linear combination of this kind of form. Then this half wave operator acting on U0 can be written out in as this integral, okay, you take the Fourier support and you integrate against, of, you, you take the Fourier transform, sorry, of U0 and then you integrate against this uh, exponential function here. Okay, then this is actually the Fourier extension operator for the cone, if you know this, okay. Then the local smoothing estimate can be reduced to the coupling inequalities and or square function estimates for the cone, so for this object. Okay, and let's explain what's it coupling inequalities and what's square function estimates. They both of them kind of is illustrate some sort of orthogonalities. Okay, so the setup, we look at the cone. Okay, we look at 
the one over r of very same neighborhood of it, and we cut this cone into boxes so that each of them are basically re rectang rectangular boxes, okay, of this size. So the cone has height one, and the size of the neighborhood, the thickness of the neighborhood is one over r. Due to the curvature of the cone, we need to cut this side by one over root so that's this part here, okay? Then for a function with first part in this neighborhood, we decompose it into small pieces so that each piece of data has its first four just in one box, okay? Um, then the, the solution to our wave equation will basically satisfy something like this, so we can decompose it, F, the solution into F states. The Bergen diameter decoupling tells us that uh, if we look at f and f theta, okay, if you use something uh, naive like triangle inequalities, okay, the f the LP norm of f is bounded by the sum of LP norm of f theta, okay, but that's the little l one of or with respect to the sum in theta. So if you want to get a little l two here, okay. Normally, what you do is you, you use Cauchy Schwartz. Then you lose by the number of terms here, or one half, which is a lot, right? But in this case, Bergen Demeter tells us that no, actually, we can do better. It's also called square root cancellation in some sense. Uh, for example, let's look at the critical case. Let's look at p equals 6. When p equals 6, this is 1 over 4 minus 3 over 12. So this exponent is exactly 0 plus epsilon. So Bergen Demeter tells us that when p is exactly equal to six, the LP norm of f is less equal to the LP norm of f theta, then you take the little L2 norm in terms of there. Okay, without almost no loss. Okay, so that's very good. Uh, very similarly, the score function estimate is kind of in the same form, but instead of taking LP norm first, then take the little L2 norm, we take little L2 norm point wise first, then we take the LP norm. Okay, so actually by uh, Minkowski inequality, this quantity is always smaller or equal to this quantity. So square function estimates for same piece, they are stronger than decoupling, but we don't use them really in the same range. Okay, so the, the story is following. Any estimate of this form in terms of decoupling, if you use the standard little with, with the Pele theory, uh, this will imply local smoothing for the same p. Similarly, any uh, square function estimate of this form for any p less equal to four, they will imply the corresponding local smoothing estimate for two plus one. Okay. Well, the the thing is, if you want to get to the local smoothing estimate at the critical point p equals four, only square function estimates works. Because if you want this to happen for p equals four, you can see that this power here when p equals four will be negative, okay? But the right-hand side is at least as large as the left-hand side for the generic cases. So this can't, cannot happen, okay? So if you want to prove the full um, so to smoothing conjecture, you need to go this route. Okay. This can, even though this estimate in terms of p is sharp, it cannot give you expected a local smoothing conjecture. All right. Okay. So the question, and it's also the result for our work, is do we have the same thing for uh, Riemannian manifolds? Okay. Similar con conjectures can be discussed in that case. Okay. We can replace R n by a manifold. Okay, then there are some corresponding conjecture. Uh, something very, actually very in, uh, interesting happened here. Usually people will expect we have the same thing, right? We should expect the same critical exponent, but it's actually not the case here. I will uh, speak a little bit more on this uh, after we, when we go to the history of the problem. Okay, but that's the conjecture. We have something here. We still expect one word P local smoothing estimate, but for a different range of P's. Okay, so the histories. Of course, when we talk about local smoothing, we need to compare 
the estimate to the fixed time is one, right? And, and actually we do have the same fixed time estimate due to Seeger Sovenstein. Okay, uh, in the later work of Mark and Hoff, Seeger and Sock, they give the same, uh, they gave the first non-trivial local simulation estimate for um, the Riemannian case at the old critical point to d over t, d, d minus one. Okay, it's non-trivial, but it's a very small improvement. However, examples constructed, as I mentioned before, by Minkos and Salt, they show that the RP local smoothing can only work for the contracted range, which is smaller. So that's denoted by this PD bar uh, with a plus sign. Okay. And it's actually, it will detect the dimension of the manifold in, in the sense that this number is different for even and odd dimensional manifolds. Okay. And a later work of Lee and Seeger generalized um, some, some line of work in the Euclidean case uh, to the um, remaining case by proving this sharp local smoothing for d equals to four for this range of p. Uh, but I want to remember that this is strictly larger than that. So this is not sharp in terms of p. Okay, and another notable work, which is by Beltran, Hickman, Sock, they proved sharp local smoothing estimate for the same range as proved by Borgen and Demeter in the Kitten case, okay, by obtaining the whole range of sharp decoupling inequalities for uh, related for integral operators. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's also look at uh, some background for the free integral operators. Uh, we don't really use it, uh, use the property of free integral operator, which is a very rich uh, subject uh, too much, but let's just look at the local form here. Okay, so a free integral operator can be used to write down the uh, solution to the wave equation in the Riemannian case, and that's the reason we care about them. Okay, but the general free integral operators can be written in this form. We assume now we have a zero order symbol, so A is of uh, order zero. And here the phase function phi is by the so called cinematic curvature condition. Okay, which just means that if you look at this surface, okay. For given x and t, prime trust by c, this will be a cone. Okay. For example, for the Riemannian case, the phase function will be locally given by x dot c plus t uh, times the normal c. Here, the normal c is measured in terms of a cotangent vector, so it's depending on the metric g here. If if we are in the simplest case when this is Euclidean, this is actually the normal c, the Euclidean norm. Okay then the, the surface you get here is indeed a circular cone. So in the remaining case, the only difference is that the surface you get here, okay, will still be a cone, but it will be smoothly varying with respect to X and T. Okay, that's the difference. All right. Um, okay, so there's another version of the whole smoothing conjecture, which is for a more broad kind of uh, object here is for the free integral operators. And it turns out that we have an yeah, even smaller range of exponents to expect us. Okay. And the reason being that for the f case to the remaining case, and then to the more restrictive uh, Euclidean case, okay, we have a better and better geometry in terms of the intersection of cubes. Okay. In other words, we have worse Kakia compression phenomena Okay, for the FIO case, and we have slightly better ones for the remaining case. Okay, and we don't expect them at all in the Euclid case. Okay, um, but luckily for us, since we're on, on, we mainly care about the D equals to two case, this kind of Kakia comparison phenomena does, does not happen at all in the 2D case, even for free integral operators. So indeed, this exponent when D is two here is exactly four. Okay, similar for, similarly for the manifolds, we also expect four to happen, okay? And so actually the, the work of, another remark is that actually the work of Beltran King myself actually confirmed this conjecture for odd D here. Okay, so the, if you remember, this is Thomas Stein exponent here, when D is odd, okay? All right, so here's our mini result. Uh, 
basically will verify the conjecture for uh, FIOs, okay, for D equals to two, okay? And as a consequence, the whole smoothing conjecture for compact many manifolds, uh, com compact remaining surfaces is also confirmed. And we do this by proving a variable coefficient analog of the square function estimate of Goose Wong engine. Okay, and our proof is kind of a mix of the proof by Goose Wong and Zhang and Belchen Hickman and Sock, and the earlier uh, joint work of mine with uh, Bo Chen and Yosevich. Okay, so we have uh, around 10 minutes left. Let's quickly go over the proof, the idea behind the proof. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the proof of Goose Wang and Zhang. So as as uh, as we talked uh, before, we decompose f in terms of its first part into f zetas. Then we decompose further into uh, wave packets. Okay, and we not only care about wave packets, we also care about the, their behavior, how do they intersect? Okay, and we care about the, their intersection in any intermediate scale. Okay, so for intermediate scale S here, between the smaller scale, which is the thickness of the tube, the loop packet, and the one here, okay. Okay, we, we consider all uh, interactions between the loop packets within this scale here, which is slightly larger, okay. When this is one, this is actually the R ball, this is all the interactions we care about. When this is R to the minus one half, okay, uh, the size of tau star here rescaled will just be the same as one wave packet. So we go from the smallest scale to largest scale and we consider all the uh, intermediate interactions. Okay, then we collect them into the square function here and we want to prove a bound which is um, somewhat stronger than the original square function bound. So this actually implies that these are square function bounds. Okay, but the benefit is that it actually captures all the interactions among the wave packets at all different intermediate scales. Okay, then we consider the smallest constant so that the desired inequality actually holds. Okay, uh, we really want to take this constant for this little r to be one here. Then this will be the average over this restricted square function on a ball of radius one. Okay. Then since our cone also has size one, by the uncertainty principle, this basically gives you the L4 norm of our function. Okay, so we really want to bound as one R by an actually small power of R. Okay, but to do so, we need to go through all the intermediate scales. So we actually need to prove a, a series of estimates for all little R and capital R, for all little R less equal to capital. And this will work. Okay, so the idea is the following. They use three mean estimate. One is the square function for parabola, which tells you that basically we get the desired estimate if little r and big r are both very small. Reason being that uh, you can cut the cone into small chunks. And each small chunk, each small thin slice of the cone, you can approximate the cone by a, uh, per, a parabolic surface. Then you, you use the square function estimate for the parabola, uh, not about parabolic surface, I'm sorry, about it, by a neighborhood of a parabola. Then you use the square function estimate for the parabola to get this. But of course we cannot get very uh, this for very large k, it doesn't work. And another estimate, which is the mean estimate of their paper, which tells you that, okay, you can actually go from uh, let's take the smallest value for r1, that's little r. Okay, so we can go from r little r to little r squared for free. We do not lose anything. This is a uniform constant. Okay. And then we need also another ingredient for the uh, induction, right? Uh, this can, tells you that you can go this step from r to r squared, but we need to go it multiple times. So we need really a machine that tells us how to um, go from a pair of scale to two different pair of scales. And that's what we get if we do this Lorentz rescaling. 
So the other thing tells us that if you go from scale R1 to R3, it's the same thing as going from R1 to R2, then essentially from R2 to R3. We do get something different here due to the nature of our estimate that we want to prove. But the point is we want to induct on the ratio between little and R and capital R. So here, if R2 is in between, strictly in between R1 and R3, okay, then this R3 over R2 will be smaller than R3 over R1. So for this estimate, we can use our in induction hypothesis to control this, okay? Okay, so the thing is, uh, if little r is small, okay, then we go from r1 to r3, we go from little r to capital R by going through this intermediate scale, little r times k to the power one half, then this inequality can be used. When little r is large, okay, then r and r square are far apart from each other, which is go through this r square intermediate scale to close the induction. Okay, that's their proof. Uh, for the last five minutes, let's briefly look at look at our proof. Okay, so the setup is very similar, but one very thing, very important thing I want to point out is that in the variable coefficient case, in the free integral operator case, we do have one more parameter, which is the kind of the scale coming from the problem. Okay, because we are looking at oscillations of with frequency above lambda. Okay, we need to rescale the space by lambda so that uh, the oscillation is basically has size the, on the frequency side, the size of this is about one. It's just like the cone has to be of size about one. Okay, so this is the ambient scale, uh, scale lambda here, coming also kind of com coming from little with tiny composition. Okay, all right. Um, so, but that's basically the only difference. We still want to prove some square function of this kind of the same form. The only difference is that um, in before the little f theta has our desired for a support assumption, little f is supported near a cone. But here our capital F theta and f does not enjoy, do not enjoy such good Fourier support property. The, for example, f theta it's only supported near the cone, but the cone is different from each point. So it's really an object on the cotangent bundle. It's not really the same for every point. Okay. We can also formulate the same uh, stronger uh, square function estimate as in Goose Wong and John. The only difference is that our U here, our um, wheel packets will be curved. Um, so we have, we define the same smallest constant, but here we have one more parameter, which is lambda. Okay, we still want to prove the same estimate, which it basically implies that if little r is one, capital R is very close to lambda, this is almost bounded, which will imply the desired local smoothing estimate. Okay, our proof also requires three inputs. The first one is a small scale estimate, okay? The idea behind this is actually very straightforward. Um, so if you look at the picture in a variable coefficient case, the geodesics are curves in local charts. So they're not really straight lines. We cannot apply the KDN result directly. But if you zoom in enough, okay, in very, very small scale, in a tiny scale, the geodesic looks almost like a line. Then by a certain principle, it's actually contained in a certain neighborhood of a line. So everything will be straight in that case. So at tiny scales, actually at scales way smaller than lambda one half to the power one half, we still get uh, the inequality of goose model. So this works by blocks, black boxing their uh, result in the case. And, but we still need a calculator type estimate. Okay, we still need to go from little r to little r squared. Uh, we cannot do that exactly. We have a absolute gap here, but we can do, do that. Um, so that's so that actually enough for us. And we also have a very natural generalization of their Lorentz free scaling estimate. Okay, then our induction is quite similar. We also induct on the ratio between little r and capital R. When the both scale are very small, okay, extremely small, it's covered by the Euclidean case. 
because everything looks like Euclidean case. When both scale are very large, um, but capital R here is less equal to our ambient uh, frequency lambda, then the relation between them is at, at most the square, because little r is greater or equal to square root of lambda. Capital R is less equal to lambda, so the relationship between them is also a square function. Okay, then it's covered by the Kafka type estimate. Okay. Then for little r, small, big, big r, large, we go through the intermediate scale, which is about the size of lambda to the power one and a half. Okay, to close the induction. All right, that, that's our proof. Okay, so thanks for coming to my talk.